Dr. Menon, uh, congratulations on receiving the St. Paul's Medal. Uh, I have personally been inspired by a number of robotic surgeons all over the world. Uh, and I must say that the two most important to me are you and John Wickham. And uh, both of you have been uh, role models for me. And I'm sure to the other colleagues on this panel, uh, Michael Gorin, Akshay Bhandari, and my colleague at Guy's, Paul Cathcart. So uh, I was really pleased that you followed the ideal principles in describing uh, your way of doing a prostatectomy with a view to improving patient outcomes. Uh, easily the best way uh, to investigate how a new innovation can be brought into clinical practice rather than straight away jump into a randomized control trial. So congratulations on that. The one thing which got me really worried after nearly 20 years of doing this operation is your description of the cavernous nerves uh, at the apex uh, splitting into two and the anterior part uh, going uh, near the dorsal vein complex and into the corpus cavernosa and the posterior part uh, going into the corpus pongiosum. So I'm not surprised that we have so many patients in the Memorial Sloan Kettering series and the others that you mentioned who despite our best efforts, never recover their erections after a radical prostatectomy. So uh, do you think we have to deal with the dorsal vein in some other way, maybe not go there at all? I mean, stitching it and then cutting it or cutting it cold and then stitching it. I mean, I guess we must be taking these anterior nerves uh, in our stitches uh, when we deal with the DB complex. So your thoughts about that would be welcome. Uh, there are several observations uh, some of them are mutually contradictory or uh, mutually opposing. And let me just pose them to the panel and tell you why I think the way um, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that I do. Firstly, why are excellent robotic surgeons only getting a 20% potency rate when these results have been analyzed uh, completely impartially. I mean, they're excellent and they can't be doing the operation 80% wrong. So this makes me think that we don't understand the complexity of the, uh, of the neurovascular bundle. The same surgeons who are getting a 20% potency rates are also getting an 80 to 90% continence rate. And that indicates to me, uh, that the neural innovation of the corpora cavernosa is different than that uh, of the urethral continence mechanism. I'd, and, and so that was the basis of this. Uh, and we see that in ours too. I mean, the return of continence is far quicker than the return of potency uh, in, in, in our hands. Many, many studies uh, show that there is a, a, a hammock of nerves uh, in fact, almost any contemporary study shows that it's not a single neurovascular bundle like railroad tracks at five and seven, but there's a hammock of nerves. The question is, where is the hammock lead to? Our studies, Ash Tiwari's and, and my study, and uh, uh, Tony Costello's studies, at least the earlier studies, we didn't dissect it beyond the apex of the prostate. Uh, so we don't really know where the nerves are beyond the prostate, and those perhaps are critical nerves that lead uh, to the uh, cavernous tissue. Very early studies by Muller, somewhere in 1836, did trace them, and he showed a complexity of nerves. Um, and if you look at his drawing, some of the nerves are anterior. Um, you know, his original paper is in German, uh, and I have a translation of it. He didn't particularly say that there were anterior trunks and posterior trunks, but you can see that in his dissection. And the study, uh, the first study in my mind uh, that looked at, uh, at the anterior branches was the study from uh, France, where they did do 3D reconstruction of the nerves and, and, and tried to see what went to the cavernous tissue. And uh, that showed that the trunk started posteriorly. They fanned uh, laterally and anteriorly on the lateral surface of the prostate. 
and then uh, they broke into an anterior trunk that went into the cavernous tissue and a posterior trunk that uh, 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 that went uh, to the uh, to the corpus pungiosum. And a subsequent study, a very, very new study, has, has shown the same. It may be that there is interconnection between the anterior and posterior trunks at the, at the, uh, at the apex. Well, if the anterior trunks are important and if preserving the dorsal vein is important, no patient who undergoes a radical perineal prostatectomy will be impotent. So how do you deal with that? In a radical perineal prostatectomy, you are underneath the dorsal vein complex. Uh, you can't sew the dorsal vein complex because it'll be too bloody, so you just don't get into it. But the potency rates uh, for radical perineal prostatectomy were close to 100%. And clearly that's because uh, the network of nerves is being damaged posteriorly. Uh, so just maintaining the anterior trunks doesn't matter which makes sense. I mean, if they start posteriorly and they fan anteriorly, um, you know, um, it would, it would, uh, uh, you would cut them uh, at, at the back. And if, and again, in our, as, as you correctly pointed out, if the anterior trunks are all that mattered, then anytime you cut the dorsal vein complex, you're going to damage it. And then you would have a hundred percent impotence rate, not just an 80% impotence rate. And that clearly is not the case. So I, I think the more nerves you can preserve, the better. Uh, my current thought about this is there are around 4,000 nerves around the prostate. And, uh, uh, and they are a network. Some of them are posterior. Some of them are between the seminal vesicles uh, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the base of the prostate. And some of them are anterior. No surgeon is good enough to preserve all 4,000 trucks, not if you're taking the whole prostate. But luckily, none of us is so bad that we can damage all 4,000 nerves. So ultimately, uh, you know, I'm a country uh, urologist, and I like to, you know, dumb it down to my level of, uh, of, of intellectual capacity. I think it's quantitative. I mean, if you preserve 3,000 nerves, you will have better potency than if you preserve 2,000 nerves. And if you preserve 2,000 nerves, you'll have a better potency rate than if you preserve 1,000. Some people may only need a thousand nerves preserved. Some people may need two thousand, but by and large, uh, the better nerve sparing you do, uh, the, the better your potency is. Um, and I'd like to go away from focusing on neurovascular bundle that implies that the vessels and the nerves run as a bundle. And that I think is where, as Richard Turner Warwick would, would, might say, uh, that is what has led us astray. Uh, you know, at this point, not to say that that wasn't a sentinel, a seminal comment uh, observation that had to be made uh, in 1980, but perhaps in, in 2020, we should go away from this and, and, and look at a more nuanced or subtle or complex uh, um, uh, understanding of the neurovascular model. Thank you uh, so much. I will go over to Akshay. Uh, and then Michael, and finish up with Paul Cathcart. Akshay, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Dasgupta, uh, for the invitation to join all of you. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here on this meeting with all, all of you. Uh, I do have to say before I go on that I've trained with Dr. Manon for past nine years. So some of my comments may be a little biased, but for the purpose of this discussion, I've kept them as objective as possible. Uh, I will focus mainly on the precision prostatectomy with regards to my comments. So I think there are three things that I like about uh, that presentation and two things that I don't. Uh, the three things that I like, uh, first, um, I think the rationale that the precision prostatectomy was founded on is a very robust one, as Dr. Menon kind of pointed out that you know this work uh, that the precision prostatectomy has uh, come out from over 40 years of uh, many urologists, especially Dr. Uh, Walsh, Dr. Menon, trying to improve upon the functional outcomes. But I, I think uh, the main thing that I think is the strength of the precision prostatectomy is that Dr. Menon performed these whole mount radical prostatectomy specimen mapping studies, which were uh, we published uh, using the ideal guidelines. 
and where we performed how the cancerous lesions are distributed in a radical prostatectomy specimen, especially in contrast to what we call the dominant or the index cancer lesion. And what we found is that, that if you look at the contralateral side to the dominant lesion, in about only 20% of the patients, there is a clinically significant cancer in the peripheral zone near the prostate capsule on the contralateral side. So if you were to do a precision prostatectomy, meaning leave behind the prostate capsule peripheral zone, there is a chance that about 20% of patients you will leave behind uh, clinically significant cancer. So, and to further improve upon that, uh, what Dr. Menon thought is that we should perform dedicated biopsies of that region because these radical prostatectomy patients were not selected for focal therapy. These were just uh, patients coming for uh, standard robotic radical prostatectomy. So as the second thing I like is that once we had done these preclinical studies to map out the prostate cancer lesions, we kind of reasoned that, okay, in 20% of these patients, there may be something on the contralateral side. So what if we do dedicated biopsies of that region and we don't find any cancer, then it may be safe to leave that area behind and given in, in kind of relation to what Dr. Menon described, that the, the nerves is not a bundle, it's more of a hammock, and it goes from posterior all the way to anterior, and that's what leads to good functional outcomes. So we performed dedicated biopsies, and as Dr. Menon showed the results of the precision prostatectomy, in only about 5% or 6% of the patients at a follow-up of three years, we have clinical, uh, clinically significant residual cancer in the remnant that we are leaving behind. So I think those are the two strengths uh, or the two things that I like about the talk and the precision prostatectomy study. And the third thing I think uh, maybe Mike will talk about this is I think these are, these are just ideal stage one and ideal stage two studies that we have done so far. And we are in the process of conducting a randomized control trial. We have uh, submitted an IRB. But I think the main thing I wanna focus is this was kind of Dr. Menon's thought, will this procedure work or not? And he wanted to discuss this with patients and do this procedure. And it seems to be working very well functionally and oncologically as well. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is, I think still in kind of its infancy in this last four and a half years and with use of more sophisticated biopsy methods and molecular imaging coming up, I think there is only room for further improvement, both in terms of oncological outcomes for these patients and functional outcomes. So I think those are the three things that I like about this talk. Uh, and the two things that I don't like, one is uh, from, I guess, a trainee standpoint that um, I found it a little bit harder to do this procedure, the precision prostatectomy, maybe because it's still uh, kind of developing as we went along. Uh, but I did find it harder as a trainee to perform uh, compared to a conventional radical prostatectomy. But again, uh, you, Professor Das Gupta and Dr. Menon have done robotic surgery and taught it to many people. So you may be the best to comment whether these, uh, these uh, uh, doubts that I have about the complexity are unfounded or not. Uh, but I did feel that way. Uh, and the second thing, um, I think I did not like about the talk or the procedure in general is not to do with the precision prostatectomy itself as much as to do with focal therapy in general. I think we talk about the index lesion with uh, quite certainty, but I think, and I do believe in index lesion hypothesis, but I think it, we are not fully there to diagnose the index lesion preoperatively as much as we would like to. I think in 80% of the patients, we can reliably diagnose an index lesion based on the size and the grade of the biopsy. But I think in 20% of the patients, as we have seen from studies from um, University of Michigan and other studies that in 15 to 20% of the patients, we do miss the index lesion because it's, really, it's not always the largest lesion. But again, this is more of, I think, a drawback of the whole focal therapy uh, paradigm rather than just precision prostatectomy. So I think those, are, those were my thoughts about this presentation. Wonderful. Let's uh, go to Michael Gorin uh, and then Paul Cathcart, and then we'll finish up with a few short comments from Dr. Mellon. Michael? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dasgupta, for uh, including me in this year's BAUS meeting. And Congratulations to Dr. Menon on re receiving this year's medal. 
Um, it's really an honor to participate in this panel uh, uh, discussing precision prostatectomy in Dr. Menon's talk. Um, so, uh, you know, I tend to agree with, uh, with, with Dr. Menon's assertion that, um, you know, we really don't fully yet understand the neuroanatomy uh, that, con that contributes to erectile function. But what does seem to be true is that it's a matter of preserving as many neurons as, as possible. And the vast majority of these do seem to run um, along the, 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 the capsule and the lateral aspects of, of the prostate. Um, and I think very convincingly he's shown uh, that if one could preserve the capsule of the prostate in some way or another, that this will lead to um, improved uh, functional outcomes in terms of potency uh, for, for, for these patients. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, learning about the ideal framework for surgical innervation uh, through Dr. Menon's work. Uh, admittedly, here in the United States, we don't see many investigators employing uh, this framework, but I, be uh, but I believe that um, Dr. Sood and Dr. Menon now have uh, used it on two, on two separate projects and have really uh, shown us uh, the benefits of this approach uh, when doing surgical innovation leading up to say something like a, a randomized clinical trial. And, um, and I look forward to seeing uh, future use of it um, uh, in surgical innovation. Um, the one area that I have concerns with, with the precision prostatectomy uh, or just focal therapy in general are all the concerns that um, that circle around the concept of the, of the index lesion. Um, focal therapy or, uh, really relies on this notion that we could identify the index lesion and that that is in fact the, the portion of the cancer that drives uh, the long-term outcomes for patients. And I, I really do not feel that we have um, sort of a firm understanding of whether or not that truly is indeed the case or how do we even identify the, uh, the dominant lesion. Sure, if a patient only has mono unifocal disease, then we've identified it. But as we all know, the vast majority of cases of prostate cancer are indeed multifocal. Um, and so any one of those foci could, could represent on a biologic basis uh, the, the, the so-called uh, dominant lesion. And just simply looking at size and Gleason score does not seem to be uh, enough to really determine which is the biologically dominant lesion. Um, and I really believe in the future, if focal therapy or subtotal treatment of the prostate uh, is going uh, to take off in a, in a way where we can be confident in the long-term oncologic outcomes, we're going to have to employ molecular tools to truly understand which one of those lesions uh, places the, the patients at, at greatest uh, risk for oncologic failure. With all that said, however, I really like Dr. Menon's approach here where he essentially backs up and says, we don't have the tools to do that, so why don't we just take 95% of the prostate rather than attempting to guess which is the dominant lesion and say ablate that with something like HIFU or, or cryoablation. And, and I think that this is a very uh, reasonable approach for where the field currently stands. My, I do have the concern though about this procedure uh, about generalizability. Um, I believe master surgeons like Dr. Menon, Dr. Tawari, yourself, Dr., uh, Professor Dasgupta, would probably be able to perform this surgery no problem. But mere mortals like myself will probably never be able to perform such a complex surgery like this, or at least I'm not yet convinced that we'll be able to perform a surgery like this. So I think a next area of critical investigation on Dr. Menon's part here is to really investigate the generalizability of this procedure and whether other surgeons could be trained to perform it with similar outcomes uh, that he, he has been able to show. And without that, we are really just left with the ablative tools that we have, which we know uh, in most urologists' hands could be readily applied, albeit with uncertainty as to the, the, the true oncologic benefit that we're doing, given our inabilities to uh, identify the, the the dominant lesion as I discussed uh, as I discussed earlier. So you know, in summary, I think that this is a brilliant approach to the care of men with prostate cancer. I think it solves the the problem of preserving as many nerves as as possible. Uh, it was a brilliant use of the ideal framework for studying surgical innervation. Um, and then the next area of investigation I feel should be around studying generalizability, as well as in randomized setting comparison to focal therapy as well as radical therapy. Is this going to be a replacement for focal therapy or is this going to be perhaps a replacement or a complement in our toolkit to radical therapy? Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's go over uh, to Paul Cathcart in London. Paul?
Hello, uh, good morning, and thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, Prokar. Um, uh, fantastic uh, lecture, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Menon. Um, uh, I learned a lot, especially about the neuroanatomy of the prostate, so I thought that was tremendous. Um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, my whole uh, career is very much based around salvage therapy. I'm working with focal therapists, so this actually is a really exciting uh, way forward. Um, some of the things that I see post focal therapy would be de novo out of field recurrences and, and that happens in a significant proportion of patients, albeit those patients tend to have slightly better prognostic tumors, these de novo new tumors. So I'd be really interested to see how one salvages uh, de novo tumors in the residual tissue left behind. Um, and furthermore, uh, in the focal uh, therapy setting, defining treatment failure still hasn't really been achieved. Um, when you ablate, you, you still have a reasonable amount of prostate tissue that you can see on imaging. PSA outcomes are really not really good enough. And I was wondering uh, what the experiences of MR imaging of this residual tissue is and uh, how likely uh, you can see those tumors when you maybe got even smaller amount of tissue, is it even harder to see these new de novo tumors appearing? Um, and if, with regards follow-up, PSA is clearly going to be positive, and so um, the whole paradigm of salvage radiation is, is, is difficult in this setting. Um, how easy is, is it to follow up these patients? How easy it is to biopsy the remnant areas? Um, I suspect it's relatively easy to ablate residual areas after the precision prostatectomy. I certainly know that that is likely to be possible, but uh, I'd be very uh, interested to see how, how some of these patients have been salvaged, if any have, have needed to be. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, final minute to Dr. Menon uh, and your final thoughts. Oh, so thank you, Paul, for, 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 for that perspective. Um, um, truly a magnificent uh, summary um, of, uh, of where we need to go. Um, but let, me, let me answer these issues, uh, the, the questions that were raised in the way, in, in chronologically. Very simple concept. Try to remove as, as much of the prostate as you can and try to, remove as, uh, try to save as many of the nerves as you can. So that's the, uh, that, that's the fundamental principle of, uh, of the treatment of prostate cancer. Second is that the capsule of the prostate comes from a different embryological source than the prostate itself. So it makes sense if you could find the right plane that you could preserve nerves uh, by keeping the capsule and you could remove the cancer uh, and not compromise it by, uh, by keeping the capsule. That's just a broad theory. Uh, it, it needs to be refined. Where do we go from here? Um, it's not the hands that need to be trained, it's the mind that needs to be trained. Um, you know, well, I used to say, you know, much to my regret, um, I wish open surgeons were more open-minded, they would embrace robotics, uh, um, you know, and, uh, the, and uh, uh, and I think that's pretty much where we are here. Um, if you pay a little attention to detail, um, this will be a very democratic procedure that, that most people can do. Now, we're still refining it, so I, I'm, I'm not there as yet. Um, uh, the way to do this is just follow the ideal framework. We have applied for... Uh, 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 an NIH grant, which is a single institution study. If we get funded, I'd hope that Paul and, and, uh, and Prokar and indeed Baus would become part of that trial and we'll have a multi-institutional international uh, trial. And yes, we have to have uh, adequate safeguards. It is easy to, uh, 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 to miss the planes and you need a certain discipline to start in one plane and, and, and stay in the plane. So we'll have to sit down together and figure out how to do it. But I think um, it, can be, it can be done. And I, I can even predict 
that the lead of this is going to come from NICE and BAUS and not from uh, the AUA or from me. I'd love to be uh, to uh, to work with any one of you who's interested in doing it. You know how to run randomized control trials. You know how to accrue the patients. All the tools are there. This is a very small change uh, um, uh, investment that you will need to do.